Good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to see you here tonight. Uh, when, when RTS asked me to do this, I, I did think, who's going to want to come and hear, hear me speak? So I'm really pleased to see so many of you um, here tonight. Uh, I'm Philippa Childs, the head of BEC2. Um, so welcome to all of you who've taken time to attend this evening. And I would like to start by saying a very big thank you to the Royal Television Society for giving me the, this unique opportunity. Thanks also to Max for agreeing to uh, be the chair for the Q&A session later. I spend a lot of time at events, round tables, briefings and meetings, where people talk about the challenges facing the industry. Tax incentives, studio space, business rates, cost of production. I could go on. But rarely is there an opportunity to focus purely on the workforce, the freelancers without whom the UK film and TV industry would not be so economically and creatively successful, and whose skills are recognised as the best in the world. I am therefore very appreciative that I can do that this evening in a much more expansive way than is normally the case, and to explore some ideas about how the industry and government could and must do better. There has never been a better or more important time, time to do so. Industry workers face a particularly challenging environment. I'm sure that we all hoped that 2024 would see a recovery, that productions impacted by the Writers Guild of America and sag -Afra disputes would quickly restart and that broadcasters' commissions would reset. It seems, however, that the landscape is much more complicated than that and the impact of the perfect storm that Beck II spoke about last summer will stretch far into 2024. There are many reasons for that. It seems to have come as something of a surprise to studios that US writers really were on strike during their dispute and not squirreled away secretly writing their next masterpiece. <laughs> and that, along with the impact of the strike on budgets and timescales, has had a bigger impact on inward investment than might have been anticipated. The funding challenges faced, facing the BBC, which inevitably impact the amount they can commission, have also long been the subject of discussion and debate. And in the last few weeks, announcements of redundancies at Channel 4 and of a recruitment freeze at ITV suggest that there is a very real crisis in sustain sustainable funding for linear TV, whether it is publicly or commercially funded. A combination of a significant drop in advertising revenue and an increase in the cost of production have taken a huge toll on freelancers who work primarily on broadcaster commissioned productions. The impact on indies, big and small, is also very evident. Progress for SVODs seems also to have stalled as funding models for streamers have come under similar strain. BEC2 recently conducted a follow-up survey to the one that we did last summer, and the results make for grim reading. Over 4,000 people working across film and TV responded to the survey in the few, first few days that it was open. 68% said they were not currently working. That's just a small improvement since the summer, when 74% were out of work. 68% report their employment being directly affected by the industry slowdown. 88% are concerned about their financial security over the next six months. The drop-off in work is having a significant impact on the mental health of workers, with 75% reporting they are struggling with their mental well-being. And perhaps the most worrying statistic of all, and one that should ring alarm bells for all of us, is the increase in the number of people who are planning to leave the industry within the next five years, from 24% in September 23 to 37% now. And this statistic is even more pronounced in the unscripted sector, with more than half of those working in unscripted TV say, saying they plan to leave the industry. These bleak statistics come at a time when the industry has invested a great deal of time, money, and energy into a skills task force. This leads me to question if the industry is simply pouring money into skills at one end, only for, only for it to be wasted as workers are lost to the sector. We have to question whether there is a real and lasting commitment 
to address the structural issues that make working in the industry so precarious and lead to many people, particularly those who are young, particularly those who are black or Asian, particularly those who are disabled, and particularly with those, ca those with caring responsibilities, becoming disillusioned by the feast or famine nature of being a freelancer and deciding that it is no longer for them. At a recent round table that I contributed to, Adil Lamini said, freelancers don't figure in broadcasters' business models or projections. Everyone feels that we aren't their problem. I think that is a sentiment that everyone here who is a freelancer will endorse and something that was repeatedly raised in responses to our survey. To share just one comment with you, one respondent told us, the entire industry is suffering and the freelancers seem to be at the bottom of the priority list for companies. I got hired to work on a production that had been on hold for a month. The company wouldn't tell me if, if I would have a job in two weeks, but kept asking me to be flexible. The channel refused to engage with us properly and resulted in a three-week international shoot having to be turned around in just three days. I've applied for over 15 jobs in the last eight weeks. Only one got back to me. I'm sure there are far too many of you here this evening who could share similar experiences. The Film and TV charity's recent Money Matters report highlighted extreme levels of financial vulnerability among industry workers. Almost half were finding it difficult to manage financially. 42% had less than £1,000 in savings and 71% were pessimistic or very pessimistic about their financial future. And indeed, our own survey reflects these findings. More people told us they were unable to pay their household bills than in September. And there has also been an increase in people taking on loans or unsecured debt in order to cover their bills. In the spring and summer of 2023, the film and TV charity saw an 800% rise in applications for its stop gap grants from workers experiencing financial need. Whilst, of course, these grants have provided a lifeline for many freelancers, and I cannot praise the charity highly enough for all the brilliant work that they do to help support industry workers, I think we have to ask a fundamental question. Is it morally defensible for workers in this industry to have to rely on charitable handouts to survive when film and TV provide such huge profits and contribute so much to the UK economy? Is that sustainable or is the model broken? Many of you will remember during the pandemic the discussions that took place about the number of freelancers within the industry that fell between the gaps of the various government support schemes. The term freelancer is used rather loosely in this industry, including by us. How people are engaged largely fit into three categories. Those who operate as sole traders, those who work through their own limited companies, and those who are on short-term PAYE contracts. They fall relatively neatly into the three categories of employment status in the UK, self-employed, worker, and employee. And yet the government support schemes expose the flaws in these forms of engagement. So many of those who were on short-term employment contracts were not eligible for furlough because of the relevant qualifying dates. And so many people who work through limited companies fell foul of the rules around the self-employed income support scheme. I know that this, is, that this is old and painful history, but it is worth remembering because it exposed for the whole industry the vulnerability of the workforce when times become tough and work dries up. The whole question of employment status is one that the Labour Party has says, said that it wants to simplify if it is elected, so that people are classed as either employee or self-employed. But changing employment status categories from three to two may throw up more questions than it answers. And the real issue is about rights at work for employees and for freelancers. Beck 2 and our parent union Prospect have worked with Community Union and the Fabians to, pro to produce a manifesto for the self-employed, which argues for improved working rights. In particular, it advocates for better sick pay prov provision and to bring leave and flexibility entitlements for self-employed new parents into line with those enjoyed by employees. 
It argues for income security that reflects the risks faced by the self-employed and for improved pension provision that is designed to meet their needs. I do appreciate that changing government policy probably feels like it's in the too difficult box right now, but nothing worthwhile ever changed overnight. I think it is important that those of us who want to see change have some clear policy goals to aim for as we also seek to persuade industry stakeholders to come together to support change. We know that many industry workers feel that things cannot go on as they are. I wanted again to just share a few reflections that film and TV workers gave in our survey. One respondent said, I feel abandoned. I've dedicated my life to this career and overnight everything I've worked towards has fallen apart. Another said, to have given up so much of my life to working in TV, long hours, stressful contracts, weeks away from home, only to find myself finding it impossible to now get work is the most soul-destroying part. I'm struggling to find an alternative full-time job with my TV CV. I've worked less than six months of this financial year. This is the lowest I've ever felt in all honesty, honesty and completely hopeless for the future. And what is worse is seeing so many others saying the same thing. And a third told us, I'm scared. A career I've worked so hard for, for over 20 years experience. As an ethnic minority working mum, it's all for nothing. I feel valueless and aggrieved that all these years of working crazy hours and lack of security is for nothing. As freelancers, we're told it's part of the job, of choose, it's part of the risk of choosing this job. We're so lucky to have. Yet what do we free, freelancers have to show for it? Nothing. No pension, no career, no future. Starting from scratch in my mid-40s with a mortgage and children that depend on me, thankless. It feels like redundancy without any severance package. I think it's more, clear, more than clear that we are at a tipping point. Something has to change. Just before I talk about how we influence industry, I think it's probably worth saying a little bit about how creative industry workers are recognised and supported in France. Excuse my accent. Uh, the Régime de Salary Intermittent du Spectacle is fundamentally an, an unemployment insurance scheme for creative workers, which provides benefits for periods of unemployment in the sector, providing that they have had a significant number of hours in work. I mention this only because it, it is a very clear recognition by the French government, albeit it was established as long ago as 1936, when film production was just taking off, of how precarious the creative industries can be. And because it was one of the schemes that worked well during the pandemic, <clears throat> when everyone was effectively given a free year and were paid benefits throughout. The Irish government is also currently trialling a scheme for, for a basic income for arts workers to recognise the financial instability faced by many working in the sector. But I do want to bring us back to the steps that industry can and should be taking to support workers. The time for warm words and platitudes has passed and we need urgent action to halt the drain of skills and talent hemorrhaging from the industry. Since COVID, the Coalition for Change has brought together industry stakeholders for discussions about industry change and in 2021 published its first iteration of the Freelance Charter, which includes a number of principles that signatories have committed to. It was no mean feat for the coalition to achieve unanimity on the clauses in the charter, but more remains to be done to turn these commitments into a reality on every production. I think if we're being honest, the charter is not yet embedded into the industry and more work needs to be done to anchor it in productions and measure its progress. As part of these discussions, as well as outside of them, Beck too has argued that as in major motion pictures and TV drama, there is an urgent need for an agreement with PACT covering unscripted production. Back to membership in the unscripted is growing steadily and we have an unscripted branch that is active and engaged. We know from our survey results that the unscripted sector in particular is experiencing long-term hardship. 
66% of unscripted workers told us there has been no recovery in their employment at all since Bechtu declared an emergency in the sector in May last year. But, but we know that even when unscripted freelancers are in work, things are far from great. Long working days, few rest breaks, and a lack of overtime payments, unrealistic budgets and timelines, rampant burnout, to name just some of the pressing issues. So it's surely incumbent upon broadcasters, indies and PACT to come to the table and reach an agreement with us that regulates the hours, terms and conditions for these workers. There are a couple more initiatives currently taking place that may result in pos positive change. The Department for Culture, Media and Sport has charged the BFI with a project on good work with an agenda to strengthen the baseline platform of protection and support for creative workers, drive improvements in management and workplace practices in the creative industries, enhance professional development and progression in the creative industries, and improve creative worker representation and voice. Creative UK also has one of its key policy strands of work has as its one of its key policy strands of work, a redesigning freelancing project which aims to publish a credible business case, a viable list of policy options and recommendations to government and industry advocating for policy and systemic, systemic change. So there are a lot of good people working hard to try and bring about progressive change and Bechtu is involved in all of these discussions and debates. My concern as ever is about the need for tangible outcomes which affect structural change. And I fundamentally believe that the film and TV production requires structural change to ensure that workers do not continue to pay the heaviest price when there is an industry downturn. We know that best intentions are not enough to bring about the revolution that this industry needs. We have recently witnessed the many sectors, including our own, commit to the establishment of the creative industries Independent Standards Authority in, a, in an attempt to address, address the endemic problems of bullying and harassment. I, ve I very firmly believe that this industry can and should be creative in the way that it, it explores how freelancers are engaged, supported and contracted. The feedback that we constantly get from members is that they feel isolated and don't have the support mechanisms that they need to progress and thrive in their careers. This feeling of isolation is exacerbated during periods without work and together with a lack of income contribute to the mental health problems highlighted in our survey, worth repeating. A huge 75% of respondents to our survey say that they are struggling with their mental health during this period where they have little or no work, with some <coughs> describing it as being worse than the pandemic. So I pose the, quest the question to the industry, is there a better way for the workforce to be engaged? Is there an, an ethical vehicle or agency structure that might enable more security for workers and allow contracts, pensions, skills and career progression to be managed more consistently? I don't, have, I don't claim to have all the answers to this question, but if the industry wants to convince those who are seriously thinking that working in TV is no longer for them and who are thinking about taking their skills elsewhere, then we need to be thinking outside the box and exploring all options. I know I'm not alone in my belief that the UK creates brilliant and unique TV. Where else would a four-part drama series like Mr Bates versus the Post Office have such a politically far-reaching impact in exposing a miscarriage of justice played out over decades? What else could have helped us through the long and cold month of January glued to our screens like the second series of The Traitors? And what else could have prompted us all to be talking about a book that we all read one summer 15 years ago than the latest dramatisation of one day? All of this work is created by the skills and dedication, dedication of brilliant crew. If our industry wants to continue to be in the, the best in the world, and I genuinely believe that we are, then we must do all do more to resolve the current crisis and try to address the reasons behind the feast and famine nature of work. 
We must do that if we are to halt the exodus of diverse and talented crew and tackle the structural challenges that leave workers feeling isolated, that damage their mental health and devastate their financial security. The results of our survey were shocking, even for those of us who deal with the consequences every day. I hope that they will cause the whole sector to think seriously about their responsibilities to their workforce and will prompt a redoubling of efforts to find solutions. I am immensely proud every day to stand up for and alongside BEC2 members in the fight for a better deal for the television workforce. There is a lot of work to be done, but I truly believe the passion, talent and dedication in this room and beyond is up to the task. You are critical to this industry, but you shouldn't have to suffer for your job. Let's push forward together. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was a really, really nice way of setting out a lot of the issues at play. It's a really difficult time at the moment. Um, and I think we'll all agree you've been a fantastic champion for film and TV's freelance workforce. So it's great to hear about this stuff in more detail. Um, although, sadly, it is a difficult period. Um, would you say, Philippa, that this is the most kind of precarious and tricky it's been during your now five-year time at the top of BEC2? Yeah, well, obviously it has, has been a, a, a very interesting um, ride, I would say, mm. uh, not least because, obviously, um, the pan the, of the pandemic, which, which sort of, uh, in, a, in a weird sort of way, really uh, galvanised the industry to talk about the issues uh, facing freelancers and, and, and how freelancers are supported, and there was a huge amounts of... Um, discussion about a new deal for freelancers and then of course everyone went back to work and everybody needed to go back to work and we all thought that that was behind us and that that everything was going to be rosy as, mm. as indeed it probably was during 2022 I think there was more work than people um, could f fulfill so um, yeah but I think the this crisis is probably, as we've talked about, it is a bit of a perfect storm mm. uh, for one reason and another. And yes, I would say it's probably the most difficult period um, because uh, I think uh, during the pandemic, everyone understood what was happening. Um, they recognised that everyone was in the same boat. But I think what has been really frustrating for people during this period is that um, there, there probably just isn't enough honesty about what the situation is and uh, people are just sort of floundering about you know what might happen and when they might get back to work so I think it has been incredibly difficult for people. Mm, yeah it's been a real ride hasn't it over five years and I think every it's a good time to talk really after five years and every five year increment is going to be difficult and it's going to have its ups and, ups and downs for a sector like this one and for its freelance workforce but do you think it felt like during 2021 in particular, you, you mentioned the phrase feast or famine earlier. We heard that phrase used a lot over the past couple of years. In 2021, should there have been more like ability for industry stakeholders to have foreseen what has subsequently happened? Yeah, I, I, I do feel a little bit like this, the industry doesn't um, horizon gaze enough mm. and it, seems to quite often be taken by surprise so you know as as i spoke about the um skills work the skills workforce um working group uh which was basically set up because <laughs> in 2022 everyone was saying we haven't got enough people in this industry we need more people where are we going to find them how are we going to keep them all of those things and yet here we are where it, uh, that that piece of work is coming to, to a close and it just seems completely out of touch I think to most people because mm. actually there isn't the work out there to, for people to, to do. Mm. Mm. It, does it feel almost pointless now to be, to be doing something of that ilk or should, should they, do you feel like they should slightly like retool or, or think yeah, about moving yeah. in a slightly different direction? Yeah, I mean I, I've, I, I do think this is an industry which um, uh, is quite disparate in the way that it it operates so you get all sorts of pockets of uh, good practice um, but actually there isn't enough um, collaboration and all pointing in one direction so um, I, I think 
the, the, the work that the, that group have been doing is, is valuable, but yes, it needs probably to be a bit more agile and be thinking about circumstances as we now are in, as opposed mm. to circumstances in 2022. Of course, yeah, how would you, are there other ways in which you would like retool if you were the skills task force, which you are part of, I believe? Uh, well, Beck2 is, is mm -hmm. well, Beck2 was part of the task force. Um, that there's a sort of group which uh, is continuing to, to operate to, to sort of basically um, make sure that the recommendations happen. Mm. Um, I mean, there are, there are, there are always, always going to need to be um, support for the workforce in terms of training and so on, and we need to make sure that we um, have the skills for the future. But I sort of feel that the more urgent priority at the moment is um, how we make sure that people survive in this industry and thrive in this industry and how we make sure that we um, don't uh, lose all of the gains that we have made in terms of diversity in the industry. So mm -hmm. I, I think probably there are other priorities just at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. I think two of the, and you mentioned them briefly in your speech, two of the big shocks to have trickled down to the freelance workforce i'm sure over the past few weeks of the redundancies at channel four and the license fee debacle at the bbc which has seen it yeah. given a shortfall of uh, circa 100 million pounds is going to be a huge hit for production companies and therefore freelancers um how are you engaging at the moment with the broadcasters like are you in constant conversation and and in response to adil amini's quote are they cognizant of these issues yeah, so there definitely is a dialogue and um, there's the dialogue that I talked about in the Coalition for Change, but also we are talking directly to the broadcasters and as part of that conversation, actually, um, David Pembry and others uh, said, well, the, ne the next phase of those conversations has got to be about solutions mm. and he has actually reached out to us to have a, have a further conversation following mm. that. Uh, and yes, the... the um, those conversations are, are ongoing. I think uh, what what really concerns me, I suppose, is the the solutions that the broadcasters have come up, up with to this point have been about um, giving a bit more money to the film and TV charity so they can pay out their grants, and have been about you know providing training for people or uh, providing uh, events for people and. Um, I think what freelancers probably want is a bit more of an open and honest conversation about what the future looks, looks like mm. when mm. there might be some work around for people to do so that people can make their own decisions about what they want to do. And, and if they still want to stay in the industry but mm. think that the immediate future is a bit tricky, then they can <coughs> potentially find something else in the interim. So I think it's that lack of openness and clarity that I think mm. people um, find really difficult. Mm. And has, has, has that improved a bit? I mean, like, from what I hear from the broadcasters and the upper echelons of production companies, there is an acknowledgement now maybe that certain genres just aren't ever going to return almost in the same volume that they have been in the past like genres that really kept big parts of the sector going. Is there now, like, is that openness beginning to appear so that maybe some people have to make the decision that they seek work elsewhere? Yeah, I, I certainly think, um, I think, I think actually, if I'm being totally honest, the, the BBC have been relatively open mm. about the fact that less money in terms of the licence fee settlement does mean less production and that inevitably... That, that means hard choices. And um, I think, from my perception, I think what we're seeing is uh, all of the broadcasters relying on tried and tested formulas and perhaps not being as um, uh, open to, to new stuff, trying new stuff, I mm. guess. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. I and mean, it's, it's clearly like quite a big shift that is going to be slightly painful. Um, in terms of other stakeholders, I wondered how much... You talked a little bit about furlough and and the painful covid era when lots of freelancers fell between the cracks and there was a feeling that the government didn't understand some of these structures and i guess similar question to what i asked about the broadcasters but does does the government now have more of a 
functional knowledge of how the sector works and therefore can help in these slightly different ways. I'm really not sure that they do, to be honest. And, and, and that's probably true of... <laughs> I think that's probably true of all politicians, actually, that we really do need to um, uh, remember that, that, that this industry is quite unusual in the way that it engage, engages people mm. and that we do um, need to, to be explaining exactly what the challenges are and what the problems are and how people fall foul of various um, you know, benefits and all of those sorts of things, pensions. Um, so I think we've got a real job of work, all of us, to do in, in explaining that. Um, I, I mean, I did have a conversation with DCMS um, during the strikes. They did reach out to say, can we talk to you about mm. the impact of the strikes? Um, but when I, when I asked if there was anything that government could do to support the sector in terms of supporting workers, mm. um, then other than, you know, um, pointing us to the benefit system or pointing us to, you know, um, time to pay in terms of tax bills, that, that was really all there was. Mm. And I, I just don't think, I, I think, um, I just don't think government recognises and it's, it certainly seems over the last few few um, days when Lucy Fraser has been talking about the boom in <laughs> British um, uh, inward investment and British, the British film industry, that there is a recognition, real recognition of how precarious it is. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it felt like you, you reached out about the strikes in the US and almost them um, listening to you was enough, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's sort of the, you know, the problem is over there, yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but it's been a few months since, speaking of the strikes, it's been a few months since they ended, but their ripples are clearly still being very much felt, both outside of the US and definitely within the US. Yeah. How, how do you look back now on, on the impact that the strikes had on, on the members that you represent? Uh, it was a really difficult situation yeah. for us, obviously, because... Um, all of the issues that the uh, that the Writers Guild and, and SAG were on strike ab about <clears throat> were, you know, important issues to them. And obviously, we, um, as a sister trade union, wanted to show um, solidarity, but of, or whilst also recognising that our members were being extremely uh, severely impacted by that. So it was a really difficult um, tightrope to walk. Um, I think, I mean, from my perspective, obviously it's it's always disappointing if um, you have to get to a situation where you have to take strike action, where you have no choice. Um, and I suppose what concerns me a little bit about that situation was um, that, that I think I think those strikes could have been, you know, you're always going to have to resolve a dispute, aren't you? Yeah. So, so the fact it took so long, I think, was really frustrating. Mm. And I guess it's also set a expectation in the state that you probably have to take some strike action to really, um, you know, get everything that you possibly can from mm. the employers. And so I guess there'll be that, that expectation for IATSE when they enter their, their agreement um, renegotiation later this year. Mm -hmm. And that could even potentially have a, an even bigger impact on the BEC2 membership, maybe? Well, um, poss possibly, possibly. <laughs> uh, it's, it's possible that actually it could bring more production away from the US and, mm. and to the UK. But again, very difficult from our perspective because we don't want to um, be effectively, you know, scabbing on, on, mm. on our counterparts mm. in the US. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Yeah, um, I remember it. We'll have to be quite vigilant, I think, about what's actually going on. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it felt like a very, you caught between a rock and a hard place a little bit during oh God, that yeah. period. And it was the same for other unions and, and for others in the sector. I mean, do you, do you feel, again, thinking of the slightly longer term, this kind of five-year period, that it's maybe slightly frustrating that these American buyers and especially the, the streaming services sort of came in when everything was booming and prices went up and budgets went up and it was harder and harder for the local players to afford things and now the strikes happened and 
they've moved away and, and has that just caused like a lot of destruction almost like for the for the workforce that we're talking about yeah i think i think it's, i certainly think an over reliance on inward investment i mean we, we want inward investment right yeah of course mm. we do but i think an over reliance on that and i think we have been a bit over reliant on it over the last um few years is 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 dangerous and i'm pleased to see that lots of people now are, t are talking about how we can incentivize um U uk british indigenous production mm. i think that's a a positive move and hopefully um, that will come to, to fruition and I think the whole question about the what it feels to me and probably it feels to some others is that the, the streamers you know they operate globally they go wherever it suits them to go and yet they don't seem to take the same responsibility as the broadcasters have to mm. for the workforce. So they um, uh, are, are perhaps just, just in terms of their responsibility to, to, the, to the local workforce, I, I, I don't feel that that's... So, for example, they will abide by our agreements when they're operating mm. in the UK, but try to get them to talk to us about, you know, or, or to get them to say that they're going to talk to us it is... Mm. Is, um, is quite difficult. Mm, yeah. And that's the experience globally, mm. too. Mm, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see like, where that heads, really. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of commissioning now happening internationally. Um, I wondered, I've always been very impressed that during these like, bad times, you guys talk, you continue to talk about improving working conditions, you talk about the potential to like, reduce the working hours in a day, you talk about well-being, you talk about mental health, and you keep up that conversation throughout. And I wondered how difficult it is to keep that conversation going when it's a tough time and it's this perfect storm as opposed to when it's, when it's a good time. Do you think now is still a good time to try and push these conversations through? Yeah, definitely, because um, I think the whole working environment is important and therefore mm. you, you can't just focus on um, the fact that, 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 that the industry is quiet at the moment. You do have to also talk about productivity, I suppose, mm. when, when there is work. And the reality is that just getting people to work incredibly long hours um, is not necessarily uh, the best way forward because it has an impact on people's mental health and because we all know that after a certain period of time, after working so, you know, so many hours, we're tired, we make mistakes, we, we're not at our best, we're not at our most creative. So I think uh, having those conversations about um, hours, about flexible working, about people's um, well-being, about bullying and harassment, I think we have to have those um, on an ongoing basis and mm. um, never shut up about them, mm. to be honest. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and it feels like you can almost use these, these tricky times as an, as an opportunity as well to, to look forwards, maybe. Yeah. Um, and recently you, you had some research, or Bechtu Vision research came out last week, modelling an eight-hour working day in the TV industry and proving that it's possible and wouldn't yeah. lead to incredibly ridiculous costs and wouldn't add too much time uh, onto productions. Uh, the Swedish model is already quite similar. That's, it's yep. already like being done. So you know, are you now going to be arguing quite forcefully for this? Like, What's your next steps in, in, terms, in terms of the eight hours? Yeah, I think we, we definitely want to see how it works mm -hmm. in reality. And um, I predict that it will work well. Um, you know, there are so many... There are so many um, examples of uh, where actually if you don't run your work, workforce in, into the ground or if you are a bit more flexible or if you give people a good work-life balance, that actually you get a better product, a happier workforce, more engaged workforce. People want to go the extra mile for you. Mm. So I think uh, I'm pretty sure um, the BBC have been very positive about that report. I think they do want to see it happen. Um, so I think it will be a really good example to, to see how that works and mm. to see whether or not it's, it's successful and what it does in terms of the cost of production. Mm. Yeah, it was a really interesting 
piece of research that everyone can read if they get a moment. Um, there's a lot going on in there, wasn't there? Um, I'm going to open it to questions in, in one second. I just wanted to ask first, uh, and we've touched on a couple of these, but in amongst the doom and gloom, if you see any green shoots, if you see anything like good coming out of this current scenario? I mean, I've got to be an optimist, right? Yeah. Because otherwise you couldn't do this job. So I'm, I'm always optimistic. Um, there, are, there are days when I think that this industry is never going to change or um, uh, that, that we're not making progress. But then if you look around, then um, there are lots of good people who want to do who, who want to make sure that the industry changes and in, in a positive way. So um, I think in terms of making the industry a better place to work in, there are definitely green shoots. Um, whether there are green shoots that I can see immediately in terms of the work situation, um, uh, potentially not for a, mm -hmm. for a while yet. Good. A bit of optimism. It's good to have some optimism. Maybe, maybe we can tease out some more optimism. Uh, we'd love to open it up to some questions. Probably these opportunities don't come around that often um, if we have some hands. I see a hand. There's a man in a, in a green jumper. Um, I work in... Uh, I work in unscripted, so I can see why the writer's strike affected scripted so much. How has unscripted been... I'm still confused how unscripted has been so, like, devastated by uh, where we're at now. So, largely, I think... Uh, well, a combina combination of things. Certainly, the, um, the BBC's income has been squeezed because of the licence fee squeeze, um, and how the BBC has had to take some very difficult decisions about its services um, and then obviously the the drop in um, uh, advertising revenue for ITV and, and Channel 4 has been a huge factor the cost of production has increased um, in this in the same way that so other so many other things have, have increased in the economy so I think um, yeah, I think those are the, the main factors that have impacted the broadcasters um, and why they are currently commissioning less. So that, seem, so, so that doesn't seem like it's a problem that's going to go away, that's going to continue long term? Well, I suppose unless... Um, I mean... I get the, 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 whole, the whole debate about how we fund... Our broadcasters, I think, is a, is a whole nother um, uh, keynote speech from somebody, um, and I don't have the answers to that. But I think it is a debate we have to have, because, you know, all of the discussion that has taken place about the licence fee, and, and it's all been about, oh, well, perhaps we, the BBC should be funded by subscription, or perhaps, you know, there, are, there is a better way of funding the BBC, and actually... There, I don't think there is a foolproof or easy way of funding um, the broadcasters. I think we have to have a debate as a nation about um, whether or not we really value our uh, broadcasters and the range of um, uh, television that we currently enjoy. And, you know, for me, I'm prepared... Sorry. Uh, I'm prepared to... I, I, I think we do want that variety and that range, um, but we have to think about how we pay for it and whether there is a better way to pay for, for them. Hi, Richard Goodwin from the West London Film TV Skills Hub. What proportion of freelancers are members of Beck2 and how many members are there? Uh, so, um, I uh, I'm not sure that anybody knows precisely how many freelancers there are working in the industry, so that's quite interesting. Um, what I can say is that I think we've reached a tipping point within Beck2 now where um, we have more freelancer members than we do employed members. So probably somewhere around 20,000 uh, freelancers are members. And um, in terms of our growth as a union, because we've grown in um, over the last... Um, five, five or six years, um, and it has largely been in, in free, the freelancer space. And I think particularly during the pandemic, I think um, people felt that, uh, or recognised that they needed some place to come together. 
and have a voice. Um, and, and I think that's, that's been hugely uh, good for us and an and important uh, space. So, but we're always open to more members. <laughs> so if anyone isn't a member and is here today, you've got one last chance up to midnight tonight to join with three months free. Try before you buy. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the more members we have, obviously, the more influence we have and the more um, people will listen to us. Mm. Hello, I'm Charlotte. I'm from uh, LPD, which is London Production Division. I work in costume. I was just thinking when you were talking about Mr. Banks, and that had the most amazing effect on this country, that finally people realised the, the problems going on in the post office and the disgusting behaviour. Just thinking, we work in the film and television industry. <laughs> <laughs> Do we do something that shows the disgusting plight of the film and television industry? It's something to throw out there. I'm thinking, we're saying, you know, we're, we're, it's a depressing time we're in, and we all know that. You know, various people here have been asked. I think James here was on the Sky News, as was I, talking about it. And I'm very lucky. I am in employment at the moment. But I'm very lucky. But I'm just thinking, is there something we could come up with as a union, as a television and film collective, an unscripted, that we could come up with something that could highlight our plight? Because Gogglebox are all going to be sitting there watching Sweet F.A. if it goes on this way. So it's just something to think about. It's not really a question, Philippa, sorry. No. It's a suggestion. But it's a good idea. In the wrong way. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Marion from uh, Broadcast Magazine. Uh, my question is about the erosion of progress regarding um, diversity in the industry. So your latest research, as you noted earlier, uh, indicated that the current crisis is having more of an impact on respondents from Asian and black backgrounds. And recent years, we've seen the industry strive towards greater representation across the spectrum, whether it be disability, whether it be ethnicity, whether it be social, economic backgrounds. What steps can the industry take, if any, to halt the erosion that is happening with regards to diversity? That's a really good question. And I think um, it uh, probably goes back to the 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 issue about how people manage to sustain themselves in this industry and obviously um you know we we know only too well that if uh if people don't have the bank of mum and dad to fall back on in their early years or um at times when they're struggling then um it becomes incredibly difficult to remain in the industry you see what, what i was saying i absolutely Everything that I said about the work that the t t film and TV charity have done um, during this period is, is absolutely genuine. They've done an amazing job, and I know they found it incredibly difficult to deal with um, those, those challenges themselves. But really, what their role should be about is supporting people to to maintain themselves, to get a start in the industry, to, to be able to stay in the industry, to progress in the industry. Um, I think that was, you know, the, the original aim and that was much of what they were doing prior to um, the pan pandemic and, and actually afterwards. So I, I think there is a, a, a huge role for um, schemes which support people from um, uh, less privileged backgrounds that... Um, there's, there's lots of good examples of, of pockets of work, as I said um, earlier, where people do have schemes and they do have financial um, projects which help people to, to, to remain in the industry. But while we have this situation where, you know, people just simply have no income for months on end, it's going to be a problem. And we know it's going to be a problem. Everyone's predicted that this is what's going to happen. Um, and I, I, I just think we need, the industry needs to be a little bit more focused on that as well as how to deal with the other challenges. Uh, hi, Jules Hussey from um, the Call It app. Um, 
Two-part question, I think I kind of know the answers already. First part is, is there any industry at all comparable to ours in terms of the percentage of freelancers? And second part, even if that's a no, who should we be looking to for best practice within this country? So I, I, I think the answer is no. There isn't an industry quite like it in terms of how precarious and um, uh, up and down things are in terms of people's um, employment. Um, where should, I mean, I guess, I guess we should be looking to countries elsewhere, really. Yeah, France, let's face it. Um, yeah, because, you know, that, that, that scheme that I talked about was set up when film was first a thing, and it was designed to make sure that, that they could get the skills that they needed um, because people were feeling... Uh, that they, if they had a secure job, that they didn't want to, you know, become unsecure, in, insecure. Um, so yes, I think, I think, I think I am now convinced that, that there has to be some sort of either quite radical change in terms of um, rights for freelancers and within the sort of social security system, or we have to look at something specifically for for the industry like that that will enable people to survive um, during the difficult times. Uh, yeah, move to France, why not? And congratulations, by the way, on the latest announcement on the Call It app. Hi there. Does the conversation need to change around the skills gap if the actual industry is in decline? Um, pro probably yes. Uh, I, I, think, um, I, th I think there has to be more focus on uh, maintaining the workers that we have and uh, supporting the workers that we have and making sure that they have the skills as the industry changes and develops. Um, I think there has to be a little bit more honesty about uh, you know, encouraging people to come into this industry. So I think people have to come, have to. Uh, I would encourage everyone to be a bit more honest about the challenges within this industry, as well as the the positives. Um, so yes, I do think there is a a, a much more fundamental quite, uh, debate that has to take place about about skills going forward. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think it's um, responsible to just keep talking, encouraging people to, to uh, do more training and get more skills if there isn't a sustainable um, career for them in this industry. We had two couple of hands over there. Hi, um, I'm... Well, I was in factual production <laughs> until the end of last year. Um, like a lot of people, probably part of that 50% thinking of running for the hills and currently pivoting myself into a spin. Um, my big question, and I think the worst thing to deal with at the moment, is not knowing how to get information about where things really are at. And I appreciate the conversations that you are having and the hope of ones to come, but words like less commissioning and you know a slowdown it's so incredibly vague and so difficult to base your next three six twelve months on and i'm just wondering where can we begin to get any clarity i mean we're here at a i understand there are overheads but there's a, we're at a paid event to try to find some answers and as i say i'm happy to be here but you know, I've been to every, on that every webinar, I've read every article, I'm speaking to everybody I know, but I cannot get any clarity about where things really are at, honestly and openly. Like, who's commissioning? When will they commission again? Is it after the current financial year? Is it not at all this year? Is it really what sectors, what parts of what sectors are really in danger? I just cannot get any kind of clear picture, and I wonder, do you have a bit of insight as to where it might come from for you? I, I think um, our experience has been with the broadcasters is they're quite cagey in terms of talking about their specific um, situations. But I think we probably have to 
um, put more pressure on them to, to, to be more, more open and honest. Because what you're saying is what everyone is, is saying who works, in, particularly in unscripted, I think. And um, I think that is the frustration. Um, and that's what James was talking about the other day um, to, to Sky. That actually, you know, people are grown-ups. They can deal with the reality, but they, they, need, they need to be treated like grown-ups and therefore they need to know what the situation is. Um, so I think, I think that's certainly something that we will continue to press the, the broadcasters for, some, some more honesty about when they might be commissioning and, and what and to what level. I'm just wondering if you know any companies, whether they be indies or networks, anyone who's doing things well in terms of any of the things that you've talked about today, whether it be hours or bullying and harassment or, and you don't have to name them, but like what, what are they doing differently? And what, you know, Would you what, like to talk a bit about what, what you're doing, Jules? So ju Hello. Um, I um, was uh, kind of left the industry myself. I'm in the industry, but I was a producer in high-end TV drama for many years. Myself and another producer and a director uh, founded the Call It app a couple of years ago, which is now this week on 120 projects in the UK. It's being used across all ITV studios labels. It's in unscripted, it's in scripted, it's in films, and we just launched across 12 languages. It is a means to try and promote a fair and safer workplace, and it's in the hands of every freelancer. It has to be set up by a production. Come and grab me afterwards, and I can give you a bit more info. But there's also a lot of other good things happening in the industry in terms of best practice. I mean, not in terms of what you're talking about in terms of pensions and, and so forth, but in terms of bullying, harassment, film and TV charity, brilliant. Um, so many organizations, inclusion and diversity. There's some great training going on with access coordinators. The industry is really starting to see, I think, the value of its greatest resource, which is people, which is what you've said. And, and there are companies out there, and I think it's just a case of if you can get access to the industry press to see when these tiny little news items come up and who are the goodies, who are the, you know, the ones that are really going to support you. If they can't financially, and at least look after your mental health. But come and find out about the Call It app, and I'll, I'll be out the back with a QR code. Thank you for that advert opportunity. No, <laughs> no. Don't make money out of it. It's a not-for-profit. Not, not, not only that, but I, I recall when you were recruiting for a production that you were working on, um, I, re I remember, because it jumped out at me, that you were very adamant about um, if people applied for a role but didn't get it, you communicated that with people, you actually what told day, them. Yeah, exactly. So, so there are examples like that. I mean, which, is, which sounds very straightforward, doesn't it? And very simple, but so bloody rare in this industry. People, you know, actually say, well, thanks for your application. I'm afraid you weren't successful on this occasion. You might want to look at this in terms of your CV or, or whatever. So. Back there. Hi, thanks. Um, my name's Tom. I'm a series producer, director, currently an Amazon delivery driver. Um, but uh, when um, I, I was wondering how engaged the production companies, the indies themselves are with the fights you're having, because you said you were talking to governments and broadcasters, but the indies themselves, particularly the big ones, the ones that are umbrellaed by the big studios, um, because they're the ones that are going to need us when the shows start coming back. Um, so how involved have they been in the discussions? And it's almost like once one of them starts to kind of engage properly, maybe set up funds collectively, particularly for freelancers that they regularly rely on, that they're currently not able to give work to, like percentages of turnover to then help kind of provide a safety net for these freelancers that spoke in your survey last year about feeling like they're left behind. So I'm just interested in the indies and the production companies themselves to see what they're doing to kind of support us. Yeah, well, certainly at the um, uh, broadcast roundtable uh, round that we had at the beginning of the year, there were a couple of the indies present and um, in inevitably, as I, as I said, they, they are facing similar challenges. But I do think you're right in that... Uh, 
I'm not sure, quite sure, as, as I sort of posed the, the question, is there, a, is there a better way of um, people being engaged and employed in, in this industry? I am really saying, is, is there a way that broadcasters, um, indies, um, streamers can sort of uh, fund a, f find a way of making sure that people can sustain themselves um, in, in times of when they're not working as well as in times when they are working other than bunging money to the film and TV charity which, which they've been doing from time to time I think, I think it needs a more structural approach so I think you're right in, in short but Could I just follow up quickly on that but is there have you seen in the conversation you had some production companies kind of stepping forward and properly engaging with the problem? I know there needs to be a fix, but or have you noticed because obviously it's so competitive that if other companies aren't doing it, we're not going to either. But have you is your experience that some of the bigger indies are actually taking this seriously and think talking about how collectively they could support, or is that those conversations not happening? Um, I would say less so. I would say less less than broadcasters, but but maybe that's a front that we have to pursue more doggedly going forward. Thank you. Should we just have one more? Um, unfortunately, I think we're slightly over time, uh, but this person has had her hand up for a little while. Um, it's more of a comment than a question, just following up um, on the you know, central employment or the French scheme, there is precedent in Unscripted for, there was an Unscripted training fund set up with screen scales off the back of the pandemic and 0.25% of every budget in Unscripted goes to fund that those training courses that screen scales do and that 0.25% is 50% paid by the broadcaster and 50% paid by the production company out of the budget. So surely that is the obvious solution that that is rolled out in a different way. I mean, I have no idea how much money that gets and whether that would be a drop in the ocean in terms of some kind of universal basic income for us all or a sort of insurance scheme fund. But there is, there is clear precedent the broadcasters and the Indies and PACT have come together before to do it just for a different reason. Yeah, indeed. It, it is any, you know, it is possible, isn't it? it is po there are solutions that... that can, if that, where there's a will, there's a, there's a way, I guess. Good. Good point to end on. But I'm sure you'll be hanging around for a bit. Maybe there's an yep. opportunity for more conversation. But thank you so, so much. It's been really, really great. <laughs>